Um, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Joshua Sokolar. I'm uh, the chair of the colloquium committee here at Duke. Um, and I want to welcome my, my colleagues uh, from UNC to our colloquium series that we're running jointly this semester. <laughs> um, this week, we're, we're uh, lucky to have Bob Jaffe here oh. from MIT. Can we stop that? Um, we've been hoping to get him here for some time, and we would have liked to get him in person, but uh, since this was set up for this date anyway, we're going to settle for a, a video visit. Um, I just want to remind everybody, please keep yourself muted unless you're asking a question. And if you would like to ask a question during the talk, please only short questions during the talk for, for purposes of clarification. Um, you'll have a chance to argue if you want after, after the talk is over. Um, so if you want to ask a question, I'll be monitoring the participants list and use, please use the raise hand feature. Um, the, um, at the end of the talk, we'll have, of course, a, a chance for, for longer questions and answers. Um, so I am going to turn it over now to Bernd Mueller to introduce our speaker. Bernd? Yeah, thanks, Josh. Um, so um, first of all, uh, let me uh, say that I'm really standing in here for Haiyan Gao. Um, Haiyan uh, wanted to uh, do this, but Unfortunately, she found out uh, that she had a teaching obligation right at this time that she uh, could not um, get out of. And so she uh, asked me uh, to uh, uh, introduce uh, Bob, which of course I'm doing with great pleasure because I've known Bob for uh, many, many years. Um, so Bob um, got his undergraduate degree at Princeton, then went to Stanford University uh, to get his PhD. And afterwards, he began his long career at uh, MIT, first as a research associate, assistant professor, associate professor, professor, and now as the Morning Star Professor of Physics. Um, Bob was one of those, or is one of those scientists who uh, begin their career with a bang. Um, in 1974, he co-authored two papers together with colleagues uh, at MIT that really put hadronic physics uh, in the context of quantum chromodynamics on a completely new footing. They're now known as the MIT bag model. And although we understand now that it does not, that this model doesn't capture all the important aspects of QCD, not all the symmetries and so forth, it captures one of the most fundamental aspects of QCD, and that is that quark confinement is intimately related to the properties of the QCD vacuum. And the MIT bag model was the first model that was able uh, to describe this property in, in very extensive ways and to allow to think not only of hadrons made up of quarks and antiquarks or three quarks, but also of hadrons that have more complex quark content as they have become very fashionable and very interesting in recent years, like two quarks, two antiquarks, pentaquarks. And it even allowed to think in a systematic way about how excited hadronic states eventually, when they become larger and larger, would transition to a quark gluon plasma. So these two papers together now have over 4,000 citations. Uh, they're still being used for um, conceptual understanding of some aspects of hadronic structure. And um, there was, of course, really a revolution in hadronic physics based on, on, on these developments in the 1970s and early 1980s. Later in the 1980s and in the 1990s, um, Bob turned his attention to uh, understanding the structure functions of quarks inside nucleons and nuclei uh, in the context of the so-called EMC effect, but also even more interestingly and importantly uh, in terms of the polarization of uh, quarks inside a polarized nucleon. Um, and this has turned into an extremely 
um, a vibrant field of research. And as a matter of fact, one could make an argument that um, it is really la laid the original foundations for what now is the electron ion collider, the next major facility that nuclear physics is constructing in the United States. Um, in the following years, um, Bob also wrote a number of very insightful papers um, about, uh, again, the vacuum and the vacuum energy in the context of fields, uh, the presence of fields. And he showed in very elegant ways how the Casimir effect that is usually thought of as induced by boundary conditions emerges in a systematic way out of more smoother um, field configurations um, in, uh, by using analytic properties of Green's functions. So um, he has been um, a visiting professor at many um, institutions, uh, too many to name here, but one in particular was uh, very seminal in the years 1997, 98. He was a visiting fellow at the uh, Brecon BNL Research Institute shortly after its formation. And he laid the groundwork there for the Rick Spin program. Uh, so the fact that Rick ultimately uh, had a very successful program of exploring the spin properties of the proton in polarized proton proton collisions really was uh, the foundations for that were laid in, in, in Bob's visit, visit there. Over the last um, decade and a half, roughly, uh, Bob has become very interested in figuring out how the concept of energy, not only in terms of its physics importance, but also in, in terms of its societal importance, could be taught at universities. And uh, he's written a textbook uh, about this, and uh, I think the colloquium today will really be um, a, a, a exposition of his insights that he has developed uh, in, in that recent time. So it's a great pleasure, Bob, to uh, have you here for a colloquium at Duke, and um, that's all I have to say. The word from now on is yours. Thank you, Baron. Uh, I have to say that was a very generous introduction. It's, it's good to see you. Um, and it's wonderful to visit Duke, even though I'm afraid it's a virtual visit. Um, maybe we're going to have too many of these in the future. Um, let me share my screen so I can begin my talk. I hope you all can see that. Um, so th this is going to be a somewhat unusual colloquium. Most times when people give colloquia, they're talking about recent advances in research. And uh, that's certainly the way I've given colloquia over the years. But uh, today I'm going to talk about an adventure in uh, curriculum development and pedagogy that I got involved with about 15 years ago and which has kept me busy for the intervening period. Um, the, uh, yes, uh, the talks are going to be organized around uh, basically a, a set of connected things. Um, uh, the concepts involving energy, uh, the course that fell out of the concepts, and the book that uh, ended up being generated by the course. Um, I think we all as physicists have some connection with the concept of energy. It's certainly a primary concept when we think about uh, physical systems. But furthermore, it ties us into the fate of humanity in a very uh, immediate way. Uh, in the 21st century and beyond, uh, humankind faces a crisis that is uh, largely concerned with the way we harvest and uh, use energy. Um, many of the problems associated with this are actually economic, political, and social problems, um, as well as, of course, technical research problems. But the physics is really foundational for having a decent an informative discussion in the political or social arena. Uh, it was, so this gives a physics department like yours at Duke and mine at MIT an opportunity to become deeply engaged in what is in fact one of the most important issues of the century. Um, uh, one can think of it as an opportunity or perhaps an obligation. Um, the work that I'm talking about was done collaboratively with another colleague at MIT Washington or Wadi Taylor. And uh, this image over here 
is the front cover of our book, um, which I'm not going to try to sell you. Um, so I'm going to talk about some, uh, some aspects of energy that figure centrally in its use in society, then go on and try to frame what problem we're confronting, uh, talk about the structure of the course and the book, and then just illustrate some of the lessons that come from thinking hard about this subject and trying to formulate it in a way that's accessible to uh, scientifically literate undergraduates. Um, really, what, what makes energy difficult for commonplace discussion and uh, makes it such a rich subject in uh, the study of physics is that it, it has really a dual nature. Much of what we do is governed by the conservation of energy. As we know, Hamiltonian systems that we encounter from mechanics to electrodynamics, even in cosmology, uh, are governed by conservation of energy. They're structured and their dynamics can be followed by the flow of conserved energy. Yet, on the other hand, in other areas of physics, and especially in its application to other fields like biology and ecology and in human society, uh, we freely talk about energy being consumed. And this idea that it's on one hand conserved and on the other hand consumed is both a uh, fundamental paradox and also uh, a lively source of the interaction of, of physics and society. So let me say some words about that. Um, uh, the, the clearest statement of conservation of energy is uh, due to Emma Nurther at the turn of the 19th, uh, turn of the 20th century, um, who showed that in any physical system whose laws are invariant in time, which is uh, usually most systems that we talk about, especially those that are free from outside influence or isolated, there is a physical quantity which is energy and which is conserved. Um, we often think of the flow of energy through a system as the key to under, uh, understanding its dynamics. Um, I've got a very uh, simple illustration here of a harmonic oscillator to remind you that the flow of energy back and forth between kinetic and potential energy in a harmonic oscillator is one of the keys to understanding the uh, oscillatory motion. But uh, at a somewhat more sophisticated level, when we talk about quantum field theories, uh, the vacuum manifold here shown as this famous sombrero vacuum of the standard model that gives rise to spontaneous symmetry breaking. Uh, the vacuum manifold is dictated as the manifold of uh, lowest energy. Uh, but in a more practical way, energy uh, flows through our understanding of systems on the planet Earth. Uh, when we look at the interchange of dynamical influence between oceans and atmosphere and land, uh, we're constantly referring to the flow of energy here shown in the development of a uh, hurricane uh, in the mid-Atlantic. Um, and just to give a sample of this, one of the beautiful things that is, uh, you can pull from an elementary understanding of the physics of energy is that hurricanes are essentially vast Carnot engines that turn ocean thermal energy into wind kinetic energy with all of the four standard steps of a Carnot engine. Um, climate science, which is front and center, center in much of the politics and societal issues of the century, um, is uh, based on a foundation of the Earth in radiative equilibrium with the solar energy that we receive from the sun. So here's a picture from the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report of 2013, showing the 340 watts per square meter average incident energy everywhere on the surface of the earth. And if you look carefully, you can see that uh, 430, uh, 300, excuse me, 339 of them uh, flow back into space as uh, energy radiated or reflected thermal radiation and reflected radiation from the atmosphere and from land. Uh, in this picture, there was some uh, imbalance and understanding this imbalance that 0.6 watts per square meter seemed to be flowing into the earth was an important ingredient in checking the internal consistency and power of climate models. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as we all know, Boltzmann's uh, understanding of entropy uh, gave us a language for discussing the quality of energy, that energy possesses in a technical sense a quality that can only decrease with time, and that 
the human use of energy, as we freely call it, is actually a process by which the quality of the energy originally incident from the sun at very high quality in a particular sense uh, is uh, transferred to different systems on the earth, made use of by people, and eventually degraded to a state where it's no longer of any use. Um, another aspect of uh, the uh, consumption of energy, or the second law of thermodynamics, um, is that it helps us understand why human endeavor so often ends up generating a lot of junk. Um, the uh, Human activities seem to inevitably lead to adverse effects on the environment. Here's an ancient picture of, mi of mine tailings uh, that inevitably accumulate when we try to separate out materials from the Earth's surface. Here's another picture of uh, the kind of unstructured masses of material that are generated by human activity. And although we tend to, to blame these, uh, these things on uh, the individuals or uh, societies that produce them, we have to remember that human activity naturally generates disorder and a great deal of energy would have to be uh, expended in order to sequester that disorder in a place where it doesn't disturb our environment. So adverse externalities are a natural consequence of the use of energy. That's all I want to say about the general properties of energy that form a framework for this discussion. I, I now want to turn to, you know, what, what's the problem here? Um, the problem is that uh, the use of energy in the world is ever increasing and it's unsustainable. Uh, first, let me show you the Earth's population. Here it is uh, through 2019, uh, growing now over 7 billion people. If we look at the per capita energy use here in gigajoules per year, or labeled at the top as megawatt hours per year, um, we're now up to over 20 megawatt hours per year per person, um, having grown from a fraction of that in 1900. If you multiply one by the other, you get the world's primary energy use, uh, now approaching 600 exajoules. An exajoule is 10 to the 18th joules. I'll have a lot to say about numbers of that magnitude in a minute. Uh, where does that energy come from? Unfortunately, it comes primarily from the combustion of carboniferous fuels, oil, coal, and natural gas. In fact, the uh, carbon-based sources of energy account for more than 85% of the energy that's consumed by human activities, consumed in the sense of degradation of energy. Uh, this inevitably leads to carbon emissions into the atmosphere. Here's a graph of integrated carbon emissions since pre-industrial times. And you can see it growing at a super exponential rate uh, up to of the order of 10,000 megatons uh, total emissions of carbon, and uh, even greater if you count it as carbon dioxide. Um, talking again about externalities, the generation of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the search for carboniferous fuels has led to serious unintended consequences that we all are struggling with. Rising temperatures that we've seen the effect of in climate change uh, in the United States this past summer, rising sea levels which threaten to inundate coastal uh, areas of the world, including our own uh, eastern seaboard, Environmental, environmental degradation, which uh, is due also to the search for uh, carbon-based fuels. And all of this contributes to social dislocation and disruption, uh, which threatens political stability throughout the world. Uh, I probably don't have to say that much to convince you that uh, the need for uh, dealing with uh, the consequences of carbon-based fuel use uh, is a great problem for the 21st century. Um, but I do want to talk about the scale of the problem. Uh, as I said, about 600 exajoules per year is the total of human consumption. It's very hard to grasp a number like that. Um, if we work it out, it corresponds to 18 terawatts, uh, 18 quadrillion watts of constant expenditure, average energy expenditure um, over the averaged over the year, or 2.6 kilowatts per person. Well, maybe that's not so easy to conceptualize either. So let me try to be more explicit. Um, let's imagine that all of that energy was produced by burning coal. 
Now it's not, but a significant fraction is, and coal is something you can get your hands on so you can see what the quantity of coal is like. That's equivalent to 2.2 million tons of coal per hour. The trains that carry coal out of the Wyoming coal fields are typically something like 120 cars long. Here's one coming out through the winter landscape. And each car, each uh, car carries about 120 tons. So if you work that out, uh, human energy consumption is equivalent to 150 fully loaded 120 car coal trains per hour. This is a big problem. Um, other problems that have had global uh, consequences like the ozone hole, which received so much attention uh, a decade or two ago, uh, also have global effect. But the ozone hole was, uh, problem was largely resolved by cooperation between many countries to make relatively small changes in uh, the way that certain chemicals were used in human activities. This is not possible with the energy problem. Uh, this is a problem of global extent and global proportions. So with this problem and with this uh, characterization of energy, uh, Wadi Taylor and I uh, looked at MIT's curriculum and saw an opportunity uh, at a school like MIT, which has such a large technical component to its education, and as well at many leading research universities, to uh, prepare and construct and offer to undergraduates broadly, not solely to physics majors, a course that uh, takes them into the physical foundations of energy sources, uses, and systems. Um, the reasons for this, uh, there are really four reasons that come together here. First, uh, physics lies at the foundation of all of these energy systems and uses. Second, uh, it's a wonderful unifying concept that rarely appears in undergraduate physics curricula. So it's a, it's a great way to structure a course that unifies um, the various aspects of physics that an undergraduate encounters in an educational program. Uh, there are many ed energy credentials being offered by uh, research, um, research universities in the modern times, and it's a natural foundational science course to be a requirement for an undergraduate or graduate energy credential, like a master's degree or an undergraduate major or minor. And uh, physics departments are always looking for a course for juniors and seniors to take that ties together the various threads of their education, so-called capstone course, and a course on the applications of energy uh, is a natural one. Uh, so let me go into a little more detail what I'm talking about. Uh, the course is in short a survey uh, of the sources, uses, and energy systems at a scientifically literate level. The prerequisites are a year of calculus, a year of physics with calculus, and a term of university chemistry, though a good high school course in chemistry would certainly suffice. These are the ingredients in the prerequisites for most majors in the hard sciences and in various fields of engineering connected to them like mechanical, uh, chemical, and electrical engineering. Um, I wanna follow the uh, course now in more detail. Uh, the idea turned into the course, the course turned into, le into lecture notes, the lecture notes turned into a textbook. Um, I think it's useful to look at this course the way it fits into the spectrum of pedagogy in areas involving energy. So here's the spectrum. It starts at the infrared and it goes to the ultraviolet. Uh, on the infrared sign side are courses that are somehow lumped into the topic of physics for poets. Um, such courses have no equations, few derivations. Typically, they include both energy and environmental issues. And typically, they mix physics with issues of regulation, uh, energy economics, and energy policy. Uh, there are many wonderful courses of this character that help to educate non-scientists in the basics of energy issues. A classic example is uh, Richard Muller's course at Berkeley, known as Physics for Future Presidents. And to emphasize my point, uh, Muller says, no prior physics is required. In fact, even if you had no physics in high school, you will not be at a disadvantage. At the ultraviolet end of the spectrum, there are lots of technical specialty courses uh, offered at Duke and at MIT, advanced undergraduate or graduate courses, which typically specialize to one technology 
and are typically in an engineering as opposed to a physics style. Uh, one can pull literally dozens of these from your catalog or MIT's catalog. Here are a few ranging from thermal fluids engineering in our mechanical engineering department to introduction to nanoelectronics in our EE department. So the course we're interested in falls uh, safely in the middle of this spectrum. It's physics centric, it's technical, it starts from fundamentals the way physics courses do, and it's broadly accessible to science and engineering majors. It literally looks at energy through the lens of physics and organizes physics through the lens of energy. Um, I wanna emphasize this is a physics course. Um, it includes only the science of energy. We do not talk about economics and we do not talk about policy in the course. Um, I certainly believe strongly that many of the issues we're fronting, confronting, uh, trying to solve the problem of supplying renewable energy to the world are strongly, if not essentially, dictated by policy, regulation, politics, and economics. Um, but the science should stand alone and be appreciated by everybody, no matter what side they take in these discussions. Providing a common foundation of science avoids alienating half your audience and also making your course obsolete uh, literally a few years after it's developed. Had we developed our course involving energy policy in 2005, we would have said nothing about fracking, which has completely restructured the carbon-based fuel structure in the United States. Um, when, by talking about the basic physics, our course is thankfully still relevant. Um, how do you organize a course that covers such a broad menu of, of issues? Well, we're talking about sources, we're talking about uses, we're talking about the transformations between them, and we're talking about the systems that make use, take the sources, turn them into uses, and the externalities that are developed out of that. It's useful to take another way of looking at this course and organizing it, to try to understand what aspects of physics are involved. Uh, so what I wanna do on this slide is look at, in brief, the flow of energy, primary energy in the universe and on Earth. Um, energy in our universe starts with matter collapsing under gravity. Uh, when it's collapsed to a sufficient density and temperature, nuclear fusion begins in stars. Nuclear fusion in stars gives rise eventually to synthesis of lots of different nuclear isotopes. A few very unusual isotopes have properties that make them amenable to sustain fission and therefore generate nuclear power. Uh, a few other unusual isotopes are amenable to uh, nuclear fusion and make them the source of fusion power. And various uh, other isotopes, both the fission and fusion related isotopes, and many others are radioactive and influence our environment uh, in natural and man-made ways. Now there's another side to nuclear fusion in stars, which dictates the way energy flows to the surface of the earth, and that's through sunlight. So sunlight, uh, which is thermal radiation, uh, generates over millennia, over eons, fossil fuels, uh, which then are burned to supply energy. Uh, it gives rise in a secondary way to hydropower through the condensation of water that has evaporated. Uh, condensation of water in the atmosphere gives rise to wind and wind power. And the study of energy in the context of solar energy uh, makes it necessary for us to look at the solar voltaic energy and solar thermal energy. If you think for a minute about what's left out here, you'll realize that there are a couple of forms of energy that are not in this list, and they have to do directly with matter collapsing under gravity. Uh, one is tidal energy, a gravitational energy source, and another is geothermal energy, some fraction of which in the Earth's uh, molten core is due to the collapse of the Earth uh, from its original structure, and some fraction of which is due to radioactive isotopes. So with a menu like this, you can pepper it with the different fields of physics that it engages. Um, as you can see, all of the interactions that we study in basic physics, um, uh, in particular nuclear effects, the nuclear structure, nuclear decays, important aspects of quantum mechanics, in, in particular tunneling, 
um, which is responsible for many of the reactions and radioactive processes uh, that are associated with nuclear energy. Understanding black body radiation requires an, an excursion into thermodynamics and statistical physics, as well as uh, understanding sunlight on the earth requires a detour into celestial mechanics. To understand solar volcanic energy, we have to get into uh, solid state physics and the physics of semiconductors and to understand the wind, we need to touch upon fluid dynamics. So there's an opportunity to survey many areas that are common in undergraduate physics, but also areas like fluid dynamics uh, and semiconductor physics that may be omitted in a typical physics majors program. Well, having said all that, um, I, I still haven't really said what we do in the course. And I think the easiest way to uh, give you a quick introduction to the course is to take a visual tour of images from the various slides in the course that lead you through the structure of the material in the course. So for the next five or 10 minutes, I'm gonna show you a bunch of slides, uh, waterfall slides to show you what we actually do. Um, the course starts with a review of mechanical and electromagnetic energy electrical energy transmission in wires, uh, first look at the energy grid, electrical energy transmission in waves. Uh, an excursion into the first law of thermodynamics enables us to understand thermal energy and heat, and we immediately look at heat and thermal energy flow uh, through systems as conduction, here in a layer of still air near a window, radiation, and convection, once again, convection in the vicinity of a double paned window. Uh, a further excursion to thermodynamics brings us to the second law. So we spend several lectures uh, trying to uh, get a firm calculational understanding of the second law of thermodynamics. With that in hand, we can start talking about heat engines. Um, we pull apart an internal combustion engine. We look at gas phase engines, for example, the Stirling cycle with its novel applications. And then unusual for physics course, I think we take a hard look at the steam uh, power cycles that are the workhorses of generating electrical energy from fossil fuels and nuclear sources. The here picture of the Rankine steam cycle. Um, we put aside uses of, uh, uses of energy for a while and start looking at energy sources. Going back to nuclear physics, uh, we look at the stability of nuclei, uh, the nuclear elements that are stable or long lived, uh, the process of nuclear decays that give rise to radioactive isotopes. And here we uh, need to understand the quantum mechanics of tunneling to understand why some nuclei have very short lifetimes, why ver some nuclei have very long lifetimes, and why some nuclei can undergo slow neutron driven fission. Once we understand the basics of fission, we can follow the neutrons path to a fission reactor and understand the basics of nuclear reactor uh, uh, behavior and construction and nuclear safety. Uh, after that, we turn to uh, the physics of nuclear fusion, of confinement of uh, hot plasmas uh, within electromagnetic and magnetic uh, tokamaks. And then uh, we spend some uh, considerable time looking at radiation. Uh, radiation as it is naturally occurring in our environment and the interactions of penetrating radiation with uh, materials, including biological materials like us. We then turn to solar radiation. The first thing we do is derive the Planck spectrum of black body radiation so we can understand what's coming at us from the sun and how it gets absorbed by materials in the way, how the energy at the top of the atmosphere from the sun is uh, absorbed uh, preferentially in particular frequency bands leading to the spectrum of radiation we see on the surface of the earth and how are different areas of the earth uh, uh, receiving different amounts of solar radiation a look at celestial mechanics the earth's orbital dynamics um, and the relation between the orbital dynamics and latitude on the surface of the earth here's a picture of the average uh, yearly uh, average insulation in, in terms of hours of full sunlight uh, across the year as a function of latitude from the equator to almost to the North Pole. Uh, to harvest solar energy, we have to make an excursion into condensed matter physics, understand the band and gap structure of solids 
as a consequence of the elementary structure of uh, discrete states in quantum mechanics. Uh, the building of photodiodes by um, uh, adding P and N type uh, materials to a semiconductor. And then looking in detail at the dynamics of the electrodynamics of semiconductors. Uh, here it's personified by the uh, voltage current characteristics of a, shot, of a Shotley diode. Um, turning next to the, another important source of uh, renewable energy on the Earth, we start looking at energy flow on the surface of the Earth, where Coriolis forces are an important ingredient. Coriolis effects usually being ignored in freshman mechanics courses. They can't be ignored on the surface of the Earth, where they dictate the large-scale structure of air circulation and ocean circulation and the circulation of winds and the behavior of long-term weather systems like high and low pressure areas. Characterizing the wind resource is an exercise in statistical analysis. The wind varies in intensity, in direction, and in altitude in stochastic ways that are characterized phenomenologically. Uh, but to understand how wind energy is captured, we need to understand some fluid mechanics how a flowing fluid in interacts with an obstacle to create a force perpendicular to the direction of flow, the lift force, which enables a wind turbine here looked at edge on to sail into the wind and harvest power from the wind uh, as the lift force pulls it forward into the wind stream. Um, here's another look at a wind turbine in the wind. And uh, we're able, uh, based on that, to make a simple analysis of the way energy is harvested by a wind turbine out of the wind flow. Uh, finally, in, as far as energy sources, we look at a few of the minor sources, uh, tidal energy, ocean wave energy, uh, and energy coming out of the hot rocks buried underneath the surface of the earth. The last part of the course, the last third of the course, looks at energy systems and externalities. We turn to uh, three lectures on uh, on climate change, looking at the radiation balance on the surface of the Earth, looking at the unfortunate and peculiar absorption properties of carbon dioxide uh, in the infrared, and uh, paying a lot of attention to the primary paradigm of climate analysis in terms of radiative forcing, thermal response, and feedback that leads to an, uh, an amplification of the effects of relatively minor changes in the behavior of the atmosphere, uh, leading to much larger effects. We take an excursion into the past and the future to look at paleoclimatology and look in detail at the predictions, or I should say the projections, of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for the Earth's future climate. Finally, we look at energy storage, a really important subject in the modern world. Um, Here's one of the simplest forms of storage, pumped hydro, where you pump water from a low reservoir to a high reservoir, a very nice, simple application of basic physics. Um, we get a little far afield from physics and look at batteries, which are probably uh, more naturally thought of as part of chemistry, and look at fuel cells uh, and their application to uh, carbon-free energy production. Uh, the very last section of the course uh, is dedicated to a, a fairly close look at energy production in the electrical grid, um, how, how uh, electrical uh, generators generate power, typically three-phase power that's conducted through transmission and uh, distribution lines, a multi-node system where everything is kept in phase and balanced by natural feedback systems and by operator um, tuning. Um, so at that point, uh, the course ends. Everybody's run out of energy uh, for studying the subject, but hopefully is very excited about it for future work. Um, so that is uh, basically uh, a picture of the course. Uh, it's a lot of material. Um, we teach it uh, fast and hard. Uh, it, it, students catch fire and really like it. Um, some students don't catch fire and don't really like it. Um, but uh, the course uh, uh, is written, in, is delivered in such a way that the lectures make a uh, overview of the material and the chapters in the book allow students to delve as deeply into the material 
as they would like. Uh, I'd like to talk about some of the lessons just to give you an idea of what comes out of a course like this for people like Wadi and me, what, what we carried away from the course and what we hope our students will. Um, the first is that physics really gives us very simple fundamental tools that can be brought to any energy system to try to understand what it's capable of. Second, uh, there's plenty of renewable primary energy to be harvested for mankind's use. Third, there's a quantity called exergy, which is used by engineers, which is never taught to physicists in a thermodynamics or statistical physics course, which is extremely useful in thinking about the quality and degradation of energy. And fourth, climate science really can be taught at at least a rudimentary level so people can be conversant with the uh, language and the concepts in two or three lectures. Uh, probably I will not have time to talk about these last two, so I'm going to focus on the first two of these issues. Um, what am I talking about with fundamental limits on energy conversion? Well, the granddaddy of all these limits is the Carnot limit on the limit of conversion of thermal energy to mechanical energy. Um, it's the efficiency, which is the workout divided by the heat you have to supply, is the temperature difference divided by the temperature Kelvin, uh, a number that's always less than one. And as the temperature, the high temperature source and the low temperature sink for the expelled entropy become closer, the efficiency gets smaller and smaller. Well, what do I mean by being able to use this in a simple and direct way to make forceful statements? Uh, I'd like to apply it to the problem of ocean thermal, ocean thermal energy conversion. Uh, the upper layers of the ocean store vast amounts of thermal energy. About 30 watts per square meter of solar input is absorbed into the ocean surface. Uh, the rest is either reflected uh, or give, stored in it gives rise to evaporation of water vapor from the, Earth, from the ocean surface. Um, this amounts to thousands of terawatts. Remember, mankind uses 18 terawatts on average. Uh, humankind uses 18 terawatts uh, and thousands of terawatts of solar energy are constantly being poured into the upper layers of the ocean. In fact, 5,500 uh, times 10 to the 21st, I think a 10 to the 21st is a zeta joule, I'm not sure, but 5,500 times 10 to the 21st uh, joules of stored energy uh, can be found in the top 100 meters of tropical ocean relative to the temperature at depth. However, the temperature difference between the ocean surface and the abyss is only about 25 degrees centigrade. So the Carnot limit on any engine that would extract useful work from ocean uh, heat differences is 8%. Now solar energy comes to us with a high from a high temperature source at 6,000 degrees Kelvin. So the Carnot limit on solar energy, ex extraction of useful work from solar energy is 95%. Uh, as we'll see shortly, modern solar energy uh, farms manage on net to extract somewhere between five and 7% of the solar energy that falls on, this, on, their, on the farm. Um, so Carnot limits are far from saturated by practical systems. So the idea of, of extracting usable energy from the ocean temperature difference is deeply disfavored by elementary basic physics. And in fact, real OTEC systems, which have only been built at the pilot or demonstration level, cannot capture more than one to two percent of the available energy. Um, the uh, Carnot limit simply, simply kills you. Um, there are lesser known but also very important limits uh, on uh, basic limits from the physics. Uh, another example is Betz's limit on the wind, tur on wind turbine efficiency. Um, it's called Betz's limit because it was discovered by uh, the Russian uh, fluid mechanicist Zhukovsky and the English fluid mechanicist Lanchester. Betz was the third person to discover it and as often as the case his name stuck. Uh, the theorem is that at, at most a fraction of 16 27ths of the power passing through a given cross-sectional area in a fluid flow can be captured by a mechanical device like a wind turbine operating in the plane perpendicular to the unrestricted fluid flow. 
Um, there's a relatively simple derivation that's sketched here in a few lines, uh, how you would extract power from a fluid flow by sticking uh, something in the way. Um, if it doesn't move, you have, uh, you have plenty of force, but no recoil velocity. If it moves with the velocity of the fluid, you have uh, no force, but plenty of recoil velocity. So in those two extremes, you get no power. In between, the maximum power occurs when the recoil velocity is one third of the fluid flow. And that translates into 16 27 of the power density in the fluid. So what's, what's this good for? Well, it immediately tells us that wind power is a mature technology. If you look at modern horizontal axis wind turbines, the kinds that are being built in Texas and off the shores of uh, New England and elsewhere in the United States, um, they, uh, at their rated wind speed, they come very close, relatively close to Betz's limit. Um, there's an extension of Betz, Betz's limit, which uh, uh, introduces the speed tip ratio, which is the speed at which the tip of the blades move compared to the wind speed. And it get a stronger limit as a function of tip speed ratio. Um, if you look at the power output of a three megawatt wind turbine, this one is a Vestas turbine, the rated, the rated wind speed for three megawatts power is about 13 uh, meters per second. As, as the wind turbine powers up, um, as it turns faster and faster, the power output grows to three megawatts and the power coefficient, which is the efficiency, peaks during this, this run up um, at a number which is above 40% compared to the Betz's limit of 58, uh, 59%. So modern wind turbines do a relatively good, uh, quite a good job of capturing what they could from a wind flow. It's not a place where you can expect major breakthroughs. Um, finally, um, in the course of uh, discussion of basic limits, we come to one of the more subtle ones, but one that's very important, and that's the shockley quiser limit on the efficiency of a photovoltaic, which has a single junction. While this is a more subtle question, it arises later in the course. The limit on the power that can be harvested compared to the incident power, uh, incident energy, in this case from the sun, uh, on a uh, flat surface is a product of three terms, one of which is determined by the voltage current characteristic of the photodiode, another of which is due to the gap structure of the photovoltaic material itself. If photons have less energy than the gap, they don't get observed. If photons have greater energy than the gap, they can only deliver the gap energy because they lose the rest of their energy to thermal collisions immediately. Um, and finally, uh, there's uh, the subtlest of contributions, which was worked out by Kaiser and Shockley, which is that an object that absorbs radiation at one temperature cannot help but radiate energy into the environment at, another at the environmental temperature uh, because of the second law. We put these together with the uh, atmospheric uh, distribution of incoming solar radiation, and you get a bound that at most reaches 34%. So a single junction photovoltaic, which are the simplest and cheapest to manufacture, multi-junctions can be built, but they're, uh, they tend to have limited niche applications because they're so expensive. Um, the limit is about 34%. Remarkably, silicon has a band gap that comes very close to the maximum of the Kaiser Shockley bound. Silicon is a wonderful material given this bound. Um, the, uh, the bound has an extreme effect on the efficiency with which we can gather solar energy. The temperature of the sun is 6,000 K. The Carnot efficiency is 95%. Uh, this limit is 34%. Um, when, you, when you look at modern photovoltaics, which can reach 18 to 20% cell efficiency, and then you spread these cells out over a landscape. You worry about spacing, shadowing, servicing, and systems integration. You get a net efficiency of between six and seven and seven and a half percent. So solar power is not at the limit that is uh, dictated by uh, Carnot. It is getting to the limit that's dictated by Kaiser Shockley and the quest for more efficient ways to hire hires hire, to. Harness solar power continues. Um, 
The last thing I want to look at in detail is uh, to make the case that renewables are there and ready to be uh, used for uh, human use. Um, the first I want to look at is solar energy. Uh, the rate of, of energy uh, hitting the Earth's surface from the sun it, total is 174,000 terawatts. Remember, human is 18 terawatts. This amounts on average at the Earth's surface underneath the atmosphere to 190 watts per square meter, and it's relatively evenly distributed over Earth's surface. Here's a, a map of the Earth's surface, and here are the distribution of land, population, and solar irradiance as a function of latitude and as a function of longitude. Um, you immediately see that people live where there's land. That's a good idea. Um, they also live where there's high solar irradiance. Uh, that's a natural situation. Um, you can see that both in latitude and in longitude. Uh, solar radiation is relatively even in latitude, um, and it's available up to a factor of two or three at all latitudes. Um, as I said, the packing factor is about two or two and a half, so the net efficiency is six to seven and a half percent. So what does that mean for um, the land that would have to be devoted to solar photovoltaics? Ordinary uh, 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 mass-produced silicon photovoltaics that are available today. Um, here's a picture that illustrates this from an MIT study on the future of solar energy. This rectangle represents the area of the United States, the way it's broken up in units of 10 to the third square kilometers into water, forest, cropland, urban, and so on. Um, here are some snippets of applications of uh, land in the United States from national parks to corn ethanol production, to coal mining, to golf courses. Um, and these two figures are the pertinent ones. Uh, if you distributed um, uh, solar panels at latitude pitch, so they're optimally pointed toward the sun as it goes through the seasons, and took the average efficiency now, and took the average insulation over the uh, United States, this is the land area that would have to be devoted to solar photovoltaics to provide not the energy today, not just the electrical energy, but 100% of the US energy demand in 2050. If you instead covered an area of high insulation like Arizona um, with uh, panels at today's leading efficiency and used horizontal panels, don't take the advantage of latitude pitch, this is the land area you would need. Um, and to make this a little more clear. Um, maybe this isn't so clear for you, but it's clear for me because I live in Massachusetts. Uh, here's the land area of Massachusetts in this picture. So um, the people often ask about manageable. So, so the I should say the 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 uh, conclusion of this is that although this is a massive project to lay out an area the size of Massachusetts with solar panels. It's a small fraction of many of the other uses of, of uh, land in the United States. And it's certainly within the scope of a technologically sophisticated society. Um, the transmission and distribution losses using modern grid is, are about six to 7%. They're manageable. They're improvable with high voltage DC connections. Uh, the principal technical issue is storage the diurnal, weekly, and seasonal fluctuations of solar energy have to be managed in such a way as to meet demand. It's a great research problem. Um, I'm coming to the end here. Um, I think I have two or three more slides. Wind um, is the next uh, most abundant natural renewable resource. Uh, there's been a, a long controversy about the extent of the wind resource. It's descended from solar energy by evaporation, which eventually leads to wind power. It's generally agreed upon that about 1,000 terawatts of wind is constantly being dissipated in the, lower ap in the atmosphere. Um, 1,000 terawatts compared to the consumption of 18 terawatts of human uh, demand. 
Um, but estimates of the harvestable wind power uh, are very variable and still controversial and range from anywhere from one to 70 terawatts. Wind power is very unevenly uh, distributed, as you can see on the surface of the earth. Uh, much of North Carolina is not a very good place to build wind turbine power. The Mount of the uh, uh, Appalachian Mountains are good. Uh, the coast off of Massachusetts is terrific. Um, the Midwest, upper Midwest is terrific, as are mountain sites in the West. Um, uh, wind power is more concentrated than solar power. Uh, a, a reasonable wind power site has an energy density of 600 watts per square meter uh, compared to 190 watts per square meter for solar energy. The power coefficient from a good wind turbine uh, compared to the BETS limit is 40%. And the capacity factor associated with when the wind blows or doesn't is about 30%. However, there are major problems with distributing wind power across the surface of the Earth. Uh, this looks like a very high power density, 30% of 40% of 600 watts per square meter. But there's a problem. Wind, pow wind power generates turbulent wakes. So here's a picture on a particularly uh, uh, fortuitous day when condensation occurred in the turbulent wakes of wind turbines lined up uh, offshore of Denmark of the turbulent wakes that are produced at the front of a wind turbine array. Um, the, the controversy about the harvestable wind power in many ways depends upon the assumptions about what can be done with wind, wind power shadowing. Um, as I said, this is a mature technology. It's rather local. It's undergoing rapid deployment. The installed electric capacity in the world is growing exponentially. Um, and uh, it's uh, economically uh, defendable, even vis-a-vis -vis fossil fuels with no subsidies. Overall, I think it's a significant adjunct to solar power but it has the same kind of variability constraints that solar power does. Sometimes the wind doesn't blow for hours, sometimes it doesn't blow for days, and it raises issues about storing electrical power. Um, I wanted to say a few words about hydro, but I'm conscious of the hour. I'll just say quickly that hydropower is the largest renewable energy by far at the present time. The world's capacity exceeds a terawatt, out of the 18 terawatts of human energy use. Uh, the generation is about 45 terawatt, a point 450 gigawatts. So the capacity factor is pretty high. Um, estimates are that the uh, uh, resources that remain to be developed, um, if environmental constraints could be fulfilled, would, be, uh, would raise us by about a factor of four. But, and they're mostly in Africa, Asia, and in Latin America. There are a few minor renewables like geothermal, tidal, OTEC, which I mentioned, a hot dry rock, conventional biofuels, et cetera, which at the present time would be minor uh, components of a renewable energy portfolio. So those two points I wanted to make as consequences of the effort that went into constructing this course. It's the kind of thing that students would carry away from the course. Basically, uh, that finishes my talk. I want to throw out a couple of parting shots just to um, perhaps induce some controversy. Um, the first is there's a lot of talk in the popular press about the fact that the technological advance will solve the energy problem. Physicists know that there are no qualitatively new energy sources. The standard model of particle physics explains all phenomena in the natural world except for perhaps living phenomena and consciousness and thought and us um, uh, from distance scales of 10 to the minus 18 centimeters up to the macroscopic scale. There's no magic solution waiting discovery. Um, the only energy sources that we exploit are energy sources that have been exploited since time out of mind. Uh, you light, you heat carbon and it combusts. You throw water on uranium and it fissions. You shine uh, light with a magnifying glass on a piece of paper and it, from the sun and it combusts. These are the major sources of energy that we have to deal with. Um, 
The second is, uh, this is probably not so controversial, but I do want to stress it, the major impediment to large-scale decarbonization by adopting renewable energy sources, um, the major technical impediment is the absence of long-term storage. Perhaps the greater impediment is the lack of willpower on the part of governments in the uh, world. And finally, uh, one last comment. People often talk about nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is ever in the future. It still faces daunting technical problems, even beyond the problem of plasma confinement, which is being studied uh, now or will be studied soon at the uh, ITER facility in Europe. Some of those problems in a word are the fact it uses tritium as a fuel, uh, that it's run as a pulsed uh, machine that has to be turned off and refilled between pulses. Uh, the power density in a fusing plasma is actually really low. Um, and the materials that are exposed to the neutron flux in a plasma, uh, in a burning plasma are not, the materials uh, survival issues are not well understood. So with that, I'll stop. Um, this is a picture of the cover of the book and I'll let you read a comment that Neil Tyson made uh, when he reviewed the book um, as my sole advertisement to encourage you to pay attention to the book. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bob, uh, for, for a really nice talk um, and, and you know, to really stimulate our, our thinking about the energy issue. Um, let me open up the floor first for questions from students. Um, are, there, are there any students, undergraduate or graduate students um, in the audience who would like to ask a question? You could use the raise hand feature. Nobody, nobody uh, ready, to, ready to ask a question. Um, let me then open it up to the, the full audience. Oh, ah, Calvin Howell. Uh, yeah, very nice talk, Robert. I enjoyed it very much. I, I have a question just out of curiosity about the wind turbine uh, the shadowing effect of, of uh, subsequent turbines downstream. What, what is the effect on the efficiency of the turbines uh, uh, in, in the latter rows? Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, modeling efforts have been made at, uh, I think they come from Los Alamos, and I think there's a picture in our book. But um, with the spacing, it depends, of course, on the spacing. And uh, typical spacing is five um, rotor diameters uh, horizontally and 10 rotor diameters uh, in uh, the longitudinal direction. And with that kind of spacing, uh, this, the um, diminution of the number two turbine behind number one um, is of the order of 50%. Whoa. <laughs> um, I can actually, since I have the book, I can probably get that number lost while we're talking. Um, but it's a significant, uh, it's a significant number. But anyway, we could go on and I'll, if I can find the number off. So, so does the effect diminish as you move away? From, well, no, I guess it, 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 it actually must add uh, with each turbine that you add to the field. Well, I had, I had another question um, uh, about the uh, collection of uh, solar power and conversion directly to electricity using photovoltaics. Yes. So one of the one of the issues is uh, is I thought was uh, that you raised was the use of land mass uh, to to get enough area to 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 uh, generate sufficient power. Um, have people talked about? For instance, offshoring uh, photovoltaics, putting you know, floating them out into the ocean, or particularly, uh, most many major cities are near ocean uh, shores. Uh, I'm not aware of it. It's a good question. Of course, it's really important with wind. Uh, offshore wind is a really great source. Um, 
there with wind going offshore gives you access to a much higher you know calmer boundary layer and therefore much higher wind velocities but going offshore for solar doesn't have any particular advantage uh, it has the disadvantage that you've got to uh, build a platform or a floating array of some kind and there's plenty of relatively barren brown lands in a country like the united states that could be used for solar power without going into the ocean see all right thank you i have that uh Walter. Yeah, that was a really nice talk. Thanks. Um, I had a question following up on um, on the question we just heard from Calvin about photovoltaics. So I think you said the the maximum efficiency from a single uh, junction is thirty two percent, and I think we're something like near twenty percent now. But you said as things got spread out, the numbers dropped to a few percent, effectively for for a system. So I was just curious for the sort of statistics you gave of, you know, covering Massachusetts or Arizona in order to meet all of our needs. What sort of efficiency does that require? Is that now or is that getting up near 20 or 30 percent for the total? So, so the first the first box in the upper right, which uh, looked kind of square, was for present day efficiency um, distribution of modules at, at a pitch of the latitude which is between 30 and 40 degrees and arranged in such a way that they don't shadow each other and they allows for cleaning and uh, other uh, balance of systems so that is with the uh, and it and it assumes present day efficiency of solar cells commercial solar cells which is about 15 percent the the example that was smaller using arizona as a test bed uh, assume today's highest uh, uh, available uh, re reproducible efficiencies, which are somewhat above 20%, um, and it assumed a flat array, which doesn't have any shadowing. I see. And then, you know, as you said, I guess the biggest issue then is storing that power and getting it around. So, I mean, how, how I mean, I know it's a serious issue, but in terms of in terms of actually making the changes that are necessary if you wanted to do things by 2030 or something. Can you speak to what you think about that? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. I'm, I'm right now involved in a study at MIT's energy initiative on the future of storage. They've done a whole series of studies on the future of X, future of Y, future of Z, or X, Y, and Z, or coal, natural gas. And now they've been trying to do storage. And it's a really tough subject because the technologies that are interesting are so varied and involve such different uh, basic scientific ideas. Um, the, uh, right now, the commonest form of storage for electrical energy is pumped hydro. So two, two reservoirs, a lower reservoir and an upper reservoir, or a river and an upper reservoir. And when electrical energy is cheap, abundant, or unuseful, you pump water up. And then when electrical energy is needed, you displace the water down. Um, some of the ideas that are being considered at the grid scale are uh, lithium ion batteries, which at the present time are too expensive. Thermal energy storage, which is a really interesting idea of using the excess electricity to heat uh, a medium like rock or uh, liquid salt. Uh, you could either heat it resistively, which is uh, not a good thing to do from the second law of thermodynamics because you're losing the high quality electrical power, or you could heat it by compressing air and using the energy from the compressed air to heat the material and saving the compressed air for use as well. And uh, there's a lot of interest in thermal, in large scale thermal energy storage. These systems would look like the energy storage systems associated with uh, thermal solar plants. You see these power towers and then the ring of up and near them you'll see these big, well, they're almost like oil, uh, oil storage uh, tanks that you see out on the landscape. Um, and they're capable of storing, uh, so, uh, storing energy at temperatures of the order of 500 degrees centigrade 
um, for periods of many hours. Um, all of these are expensive and would require uh, the same kind of large scale commitment of resources that building the renewable energy assets in the first place would. Oh, and let me mention one other thing. Uh, one of the things that's coming out of this study is uh, the, the possibility of overbuilding. If solar is actually so cheap and wind is so cheap, why not build more than you need for the average situation? Build for the time when it's most in distress and use the excess uh, energy, the excess electrical energy that you get for most of the time uh, to make hydrogen and use that hydrogen to make a carbonaceous fuel for airplanes. So that's another idea. Overbuilding may be a big component. Thanks. So um, we have four hands up, but let's, let's take two of them. Um, and then uh, anybody else who wants to stick around will we'll, um, sort of formally end the colloquium, but have a little time for people who want to stay to chat. Um, so, Dwayne Deardorf. I'm just curious to know what you think is uh, the greatest challenge in teaching a course like this. Um, good question. I think the, the greatest challenge is the immense amount of material. Uh, it's, the course is taught three, three one-hour lectures a week and two one-hour recitations a week. And the challenge is to keep the material limited to the lectures and use the recitations for a seminar-like discussion of the material, which we think is really important so that students get to participate and feel like they own the material. MIT is perhaps more tolerant of um, the, the work level of this course than a lot of universities would be, although the course is being taught at Harvey Mudd and in, uh, it's also being taught in Uppsala where there are teaching it at the same relatively high powered level. Uh, the, the other uh, issue that you would have to deal with in a typical university format is the wide variety of prerequisites that the students bring to the course. Physics majors already know the elementary quantum mechanics that we introduce um, and, and would go do something else for that week and a half. And the students who don't have a background in quantum mechanics will be working their heads off to try to get that material. Stephen Tightsworth. Oh, thanks. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Bob, for that great talk. Uh, I just would be great to get maybe your brief sense about the future of nuclear, uh, 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 both either fission or fusion for the, the future of, of human energy generation. And in particular, um, do you have any thoughts about uh, ideas for modular fission reactors, things like traveling wave reactors and that kind of thing? Uh -huh. So I think I, I showed my cards with respect to fusion. I think fusion has, is the only energy source that was always 50 years in the future. I think it's gonna be a really tough slog. Uh, it's certainly an interesting research subject and uh, worth, people are working very hard on it, but it doesn't seem to me to play a role in the necessary future. Um, fission reactors, uh, I'm not an expert on either modular reactors or traveling wave reactors, so I can't really answer that. I do feel that one of the principal problems with fission as a fuel, um, the principal a principal technical problem is disposal of spent fuel, safe disposal of spent fuel, and a, uh, an associated societal problem is the inordinate fear of radiation as an environmental contaminant. I'm not saying radiation is good for you. I'm not saying it's anything like that. But when people, a non, people who haven't studied radiation hear the word radiation, uh, they tend to throw up a screen, which makes it impossible to go anywhere. Okay, um, let me sort of formally close the meeting and, and thank Bob. Um, <laughs> and uh, just so that people who are pressed for time can, can leave without feeling guilty. Um, but I hope that 
Um, Bob, we can stick around for a few more minutes. There are a few more people who, who have questions and I'm sure other people would like to hear the answers to them too. So thanks, thanks very much. Um, and uh, let's, let's see uh, Benjamin Kaiser. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm a graduate student, so for the record, I think this course is very interesting. <laughs> I'd be interested in taking it if I were at a place that offered it or a later undergraduate. But uh, this is kind of just a random question with regards to what's explored. Uh, obviously, putting solar panels only in a state, like only in landmass size Massachusetts, is it a significant effect on the overall surface of the earth? But if you scaled it globally, presumably at least amount to percentage almost level for solar panel coverage required for power demands, assuming improvements. What sort of impact on albedo would that have? Would it be any? Has that been considered? Um, yeah, it's, I think it's negligible on the albedo. Um, half the albedo comes from reflection in the atmosphere and half of it comes from the net surface of the earth and the, the fraction of the earth's surface that would be obstructed where the reflectivity would be reduced because the solar panels appear to be black um, is, is really tiny compared to the reflective surface. So I, I don't think it's a problem. Okay. Christoph. Yeah, thanks very much for the talk. That was extremely interesting. Um, I guess I finally understood why these wind turbines have to run at, this, at the speed they're running at because of Betz's limit. And of course, all the environmentalists are complaining about birds getting killed. Is there any way around that by, say, not having it in a plane perpendicular to the wind in some funny way or some smart design that uh, would get around Betz's limit or allow it to run at a lower speed? Um, people have tried a lot of different uh, geometries for wind turbines, and uh, none of them have passed the test of time. The, uh, the most, um, well, the one you may have heard of uh, is called the Darius wind turbine, which is a vertical axis wind turbine. It looks like an egg beater, um, but it has a series of problems that are uh, uh, quite difficult to deal with. For example, if you make it very large, uh, you have to hold that top in place somewhere. I mean, that's just a simple one. And it, it um, not every, the, the, anal the efficiency is limited because each blade, as it rotates, the blade presents a different profile to the wind at every stage in its rotation. The thing about a, a horizontal axis wind turbine is that from the point of view of the wind stream, it's just sitting there. It's a fixed geometry of the wind and the blade. Um, I, think, I, I, I think the problems with, no, no source of energy comes without problems. Um, so I, I think that we have to do our best to deal with the externalities that are brought up by each new source. And I, I think that uh, with wind turbines, uh, putting them in areas which are far away from uh, dense settlements, and of trying to avoid flyways, bird flyways are a natural thing to do. Although I have to admit, I think more birds are killed by cats by a long shot. Um, I, wanna, I wanna share my screen for, I, the person who asked the question about the shadowing of wind turbines. Um, I that was Calvin Howell, yeah. Is Calvin still here? Calvin, are you still here? Looks like not. No, he's not. Okay, well, for what it's worth, here's the uh, power output of a sequence. Uh, this is a modeling from um, Los Alamos of the power output in megawatts of a series of identical wind turbines that are shadowed by three, three times their uh, uh, rotor diameter from one another. And the first is putting out five, it's a five megawatt wind turbine. The second is in, in orange and is down here around three megawatts. And the, uh, by the time you get down to the fifth, it's way down here around two megawatts. Mm -hmm. So, so the second, the, third, fourth, fifth means rows going back? Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. 
Gerald. So the biggest shadow is between the first and the second. Gerald? Yes. Yes, thanks. Uh, my question is about um, efficiency, I guess. Uh, huge amount of potential improvements. Uh, you gave the basic physical efficiencies for several of the major processes. But uh, by the time you filter it into consumer products where the energy is actually dissipated, um, how can we substantially improve that faster and in a fashion that would minimize the waste streams, you know, when the economy is based on rapid changes of things, but not necessarily improvements of things. So uh, planned obsolescence, lack of recycling of embodied energy in various objects and so on. Uh, you know, I, I, mean, I get a sense that, you know, a gigantic amount of energy is absolutely dissipated into heat and uh, is not useful for mobility or anything else. And the numbers are, you can play back and forth about uh, electric vehicles versus internal combustion engine vehicles and so on. But if you're looking at a solution that, that uh, will energize the entire human population as opposed to the 10 or 15% that live in the advanced economies uh, in the numbers, I guess, that were implicit in your projections to 2050, what do you do? How do, how do you get that efficiency into products that then you know, minimize our energy consumption and are more attuned with renewable energy levels? How so that, that, that's a really big question. And, and to some extent, it's above my pay grade. So, mm -hmm. uh, but let me try to say something. I think the notion of the quality of energy is important to think about in this context, that the longer you can keep energy in a high quality state during its distribution and use or, or its manipulation, distribution and manipulation, the less likely you are to uh, generate uh, excess entropy. And just, uh, I, I wish I had had time to talk about exergy, but you, you, the, least, the less exergy you would destroy. Um, a good example is home heating. Um, if, if, you're gonna heat, if you're gonna heat your house with electricity, um, it's the, if the electricity is made it's better to heat your house with electricity than it is to heat your house by burning a fuel because the electricity can be used to drive a device to bring heat in from the outside, a heat pump, and therefore deliver much more heat per unit energy than just burning the fuel. So keeping the quality of the energy high, keeping it electrical until you finally get into a position where you can have a sophisticated device that operates close as close as possible to reversibly, um, you maximize the uh, uh, conservation. And uh, the, uh, I do want to say something about the developing world. Uh, the, the cost of solar panels and the cost of solar energy is really low in the developing world too. And uh, if you compare the cost of building a coal-fired power plant and running it at a gigawatt, and compare that with building a solar installation and running it at a gigawatt. The solar installation is comparable or cheaper and, and only going down. The reason is that to run the solar installation is a box. You set it up, it's a black box, it outputs the energy. The, the, the coal-fired power plant, you build it, you invest that capital and you have to keep shoveling coal into it. So I'm sorry, I can't be more constructive than that. No, thank you. Josh, you are, you are muted. Tom, Clegg. Okay, thank you. Mine's a simple question. Uh, many uh, MIT physics courses are available online. Is your course available to, to students and others who might be interested in exploring this topic more in, uh, more in depth? So the course materials are available through open courseware. Okay. But I have to admit they're a bit outdated because we haven't, we concentrated on writing the book and not uh, updating the OCW site. Um, it has not been mounted as an online course. Okay. So you can't, you can't take it through MITx. Okay, that's fine. But you can buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Bob, I'd like to close with one question. Um, it's from a physics point of view, 
would there be any advantage to redistributing populations so that they are less concentrated, um, say in urban environments, would, would spreading people out more and having fewer, having more um, smaller solar farms, for example, be better in some way than having to transport all the energy to concentrated spots? Uh, well, that's a tough one. Um, I don't think so, but I might be wrong. Um, I think that the advantages of scale in solar energy and in wind energy have proven to be huge. That, for example, in, the, in Massachusetts, you can get a big tax break for rooftop solar, but the cost per watt of rooftop solar is three times the cost per watt of utility field solar. So small installations are more expensive because the balance of systems is more complicated. They're more specialized to the particular circumstances. Uh, you have to hire more different kinds of skills to build them as opposed to co large contracts. Um, and then as far as environmental impact, I think cities are great for environmental impact as long as you run them well. I mean, the, and the, the, I'd, I'd love to see the rural parts of the world left more natural and have people live in, it's like cluster site housing. You know, I live in a suburb and I wish instead of having one house in every quarter acre or half acre, you had clusters of houses and open space better for the world. Stephen, did you want to ask another question? Yes, I just wanted to add, add, add one thing. Uh, I think as I was telling Bob earlier, I also teach an energy seminar course here at Duke and have for the last uh, several years. So, uh, you know, you definitely solar, it does look very attractive uh, going forward as a, uh, a green fuel. One of the things that we've discovered in our seminar class though, is that when it, uh, it's useful to look at the, um, I can turn my video on, and also at the, uh, uh, the sort of full life cycle analysis of the cell. And that's very dependent on where the cells are made and what kind of energy is used to, to make them. There's a lot of energy intensity, heating the silicon up to thousands of degrees, uh, you know, metallurgical quality conditions that are required for that and the use of solvents. And if you do that in a place that's, that has no environmental controls, uh, you know, there's an embedded energy there that's equivalent to two or three years on a per energy basis uh, to, to burning coal just, just outright for power. So I, I'm hopeful that this is sort of more of a policy issue, but going forward, when you get those solar panels installed, you'll actually know there'll be a stamp as to where they were made and how they were made, because I think that's relevant to this overall discussion. Yeah, I, I... I totally agree with that. Um, I, th I thought you were going to say that uh, the uh, energy input was long was greater than the energy output of a thirty year lifetime, but that's definitely not true. No, no, it's definitely not that bad. It, it's I think on the order of two to three years, and it really depends on where they're made, how they're made. Uh, one other sort of technical thing that I'm aware of, just uh, from some of my solid state uh, colleagues. Um, at NREL is multi-junctions, the, the costs, you know, they are currently very niche, very expensive, uh, but the cost uh, of, of production is coming down dramatically with some clever innovations uh, with growing multi-layered structures. So basically you're stacking different gap P and junctions on top of each other in that uh, design. And so there's some hope that, that they could become a real force uh, in the wide scale in a matter of a few years and then you're talking about efficiencies instead of limited at 25% that are up around close to 40, 40 to 50%, which would be pretty, very dramatic. That's true. But I'm, I'm gonna uh, come in with a no free lunch comment here. I did a study for the American Physical Society on um, materials for advanced energy technologies. And a lot of these uh, uh, multi-cell uh, structures use uh, indium, gallium, uh, and other uh, not earth abundant elements. And so the constraints on uh, deployment, uh, on you know, huge scale deployment 
of, of cells that use rare elements is really a problem. It killed CAD-TEL. There was a, a renaissance five or eight years ago in making cadmium telluride as a photovoltaic material. No, absolutely. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very good point. Again, it's the, the materials are not, uh, they're not environmentally friendly in the mining process and their limited availability. Right. And silicon certainly has its processing cost, but at least there's a lot of silicon in the world. So just to follow up on, on Stephen's point about um, the, there's a cost associated with making these things. What is their typical lifetime? Once, how, how often will they need to be replaced? Let's say we're talking about silicon solar cells. I think the standard lifetime silicon solar cells now it, it deployed, deployed well-made modules is 25 years. And uh, the, um, you know, the engineering that's necessary to make them live longer than that is probably a doable problem. So they're, they're, silicon's very durable in the environment, especially when you put it under between sheets of glass. Okay, Bob, thanks so much for uh, spending spending an hour and a half with us and, and for meeting with uh, earlier in the day with some people over at Duke. Um, we, we really appreciate it. And, and I, I think the fact that there are still half the audience staying this long is an indication that there's some real, um, real interest in what you're talking about. Um, maybe we'll have somebody teaching from your book at Duke um, someday and, and we'll be in touch. Well, that's great. I, I enjoyed it very much. I wish I could have been there physically. Uh, yeah, to be able to. It's been a long time. Okay. Um, so thanks everybody for joining us. Um, and I, I think we'll call it a day. Thank you. It's a pleasure. You. So Kristen, we're, we're done with the